Time to begin our Bible study here in the house of God. And tonight's Bible study is going to be a topical Bible study, as I mentioned on Sunday morning. And we're going to be in the book of Matthew tonight. The book of Matthew, chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, and our title for tonight's Bible study, Moving Mountains Through the Power of Prayer. Matthew 17, we'll also go to Mark chapter 4 after that just to lay the foundation. He says, Jesus here is saying, and we're taking portions of the scriptures here that shows the content of our Bible study tonight. Jesus said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. And then over in Mark chapter 4, verses 30 to 32, again speaking of the words of Jesus, and he said, Whereunto shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which, when it is sown in the earth, is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh great, greater than all herbs, and shooteth out great branches, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. Let's begin with prayer. Our Lord, we thank you for tonight's Bible study. We ask you, God, that you would bless the ministering and the learning thereof. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in both of these places... The words of our Lord are recorded using a grain of mustard seed. Now this grain of mustard seed, though he will tell us it is the least of all the seeds, it is not least as in the smallest because there are other seeds that are actually smaller than mustard seeds. But it is probably the smallest seed that they either knew about or that they used. And so, either way, it is a small seed. Now, in both of these places, he's teaching about the importance of things that start off small, but become great. In Matthew 17, he's talking about having faith. In Mark 4, he's talking about the kingdom of God. Now, in neither of these places does he mention prayer. But we're going to talk about prayer tonight using these verses. When we, when we uh, talk about the power of prayer, we're not talking about just saying prayers. We're talking about God honoring and God honored prayers. God honoring prayers and God honored prayers. So in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus mentions removing a mountain. Removing a mountain. This mountain isn't that you can literally go out and start casting mountains into the sea just because you believe it can happen. Now, I believe that it can happen if God wanted it to happen. We have that kind of faith. That's fine. But that's not what he's talking about. Really, this mountain illustrates the mountains in our lives that need to be removed. You see, it's easier to do the physical act, not that we've ever done this necessarily, but it would probably be easier to do the physical act of going out and telling a mountain in the name of Jesus, go over there, than it would be to pray and believe that God would remove mountains in our lives. Now we can pray for God to remove mountains in someone else's life. We can pray for someone else's faults, shortcomings, situations, problems, uh, whatever it may be. But when it comes to removing the mountains in our own lives, there seems to be a part of us, because there is a part of us, that tends to believe this mountain will never be removed. Though we pray, though we cast it out, though we believe, there seems to be a part of us that tends to think, but it will not happen. Jesus then ends this section 
by showing us that it takes effort to have this kind of power in our prayer. He says, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. And so when we're teaching tonight about moving mountains through the power of prayer, we're not talking about just saying your prayers at night. We're talking about a dedicated effort with a dedicated faith looking for a dedicated outcome. So when and how often should we pray? King David writes in Psalm 63, verse 1, he says, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. Now, is this a commandment that we have to pray in the morning? It's not a commandment, is it? He's just simply stating what he does. I believe you ought to have dedicated times of prayer, and I believe those times should be when you are able to focus on God and give him the best worship and prayer that you can. So we do believe that you have, you should have dedicated times of prayer. For some, it's going to be in the morning. Some people pray better in the morning. Some people pray better maybe during their lunch period. If they have the hour and a half lunch break, maybe they'll take 20 or 30 minutes to just sit and pray or worship God, whether before or after they eat, whatever the case. For others, they may pray better later in the evening. They may pray better later in the evening. Some people may pray better at midnight. Some people may pray better at 2 in the morning. Some people may pray better at 7 in the morning. Let not the one who prays at 7 in the morning disdain the one who prays at midnight. Because the idea is to connect with God through the avenue which he has afforded to us, which is through prayer. Now Paul writes in Ephesians 6 and 18, we're still talking here about when and how often should you pray? Should you just have one dedicated time of prayer throughout the day? Should you be like Daniel, where he prayed morning, afternoon, and evening for Jerusalem? Well, here's what Paul writes in Ephesians 6.18. He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. That supplication, that persistence in the Spirit. He also says in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. So how often should we pray? All the time. You see, prayer is not just prayer meeting from 6.30 to 7.30 on Sunday night. That's not, that's not all there is to prayer. We ought to have dedicated times of prayer, which is one of the reasons why we set up the prayer meeting to be 6.30 to 7.30, to give people the opportunity to come and have a dedicated time of prayer. But the Bible shows us clearly that prayer is supposed to be a consistent conversation with God. Luke writes this in Luke 18 and 1, speaking of Jesus, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, meaning to this, for this goal, for this reason, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. So how often should we pray? All the time. What is prayer? Is it from this time to this time where I tell God how great he is and then tell God how terrible my situation is? That's not what prayer really is. Though we are able to cast our care upon him because he cares for us. These three scriptures I just referenced, praying always, pray without ceasing, men ought always to pray. These three scriptures dismiss the idea that there should ever be a time that we're not praying. They dismiss that idea. We often pray the most when we seem to have the least, and we often pray the least when we seem to have the most. When the health is down, we pray the most. When the health is good, we pray the least. When the money's up, we pray the least. When the money's down, we pray the most, whatever the case. But these verses dismiss the notion that there will ever be a time that you don't need to pray. There's never a time where you don't need to pray. As a matter of fact, when the health is down and the finances are down, we know what to pray for there. But when the finances are up and the health is up, we ought to pray that we don't fall into the trap of becoming so prosperous that we forget our God. Prayer is not so much about the position of your body, though you can pray in different bodily positions. It isn't about the volume of your voice, 
though you can pray verbally and quietly. Prayer should be more of a constant, now get this part, constant quality conversation between you and God. A constant quality. That's the part I believe we leave out many times. Constant quality conversation. We like to tell God what's wrong, though we, as if he doesn't already know. The constant quality conversation is like that conversation that you can have with someone that you fully trust. The one to whom you look for guidance and wisdom and insight, comfort and encouragement. The constant quality conversation, which by the way, there are very few people in life you'll ever find where you can have those kind of conversations. That constant quality conversation is the development of prayer to God. If a man or woman's prayer is nothing more than just the normal, typical, what everybody else tends to pray, then their prayer life has not developed. Your prayer life isn't, isn't, your prayer life doesn't show itself as being developed if you can last the whole hour of prayer on Sunday night. <laughs> That doesn't necessarily mean that you have a connection with God. Someone praying loudly doesn't always indicate that they have a connection with God. By quality, I mean the quality of meaningful sincerity, prayer to God. Meaningful sincerity. I mean, you're talking with God almost all the time. That's really what prayer is. And that's what God's looking for. The kind of prayer that has power in it, the kind of prayer that will remove mountains, is a prayer life that doesn't look at prayer as just a slot of time. That doesn't look at prayer as volume. Time ought to be put in the prayer. Volume will be there because the Bible teaches that we ought to give God verbal praise and thanksgiving, though we can also pray inwardly. People always want to lean toward the quiet prayer and dismiss the verbal prayer. And they think when I teach verbal prayer that I'm somehow slamming quiet prayer when the answer is both. But true prayer will be verbal and it will be quiet. True prayer will have lengths of time in it, even, in, but it will also have short time in it. How short? Thank you, Lord. That's a prayer. How is it a prayer? Because it is part of the communion with God. And if there's one thing we want to bring out in this teaching tonight, it is that prayer should never be relegated to a time slot. If that's all our prayer is, then we're really missing a lot. But when you converse with God, when you're conversing with your Heavenly Father, and you're having quality conversations with him. And he's speaking to you. How does he speak to you? He impresses upon your heart thoughts, ideas, entire thoughts. He may drop a word in your heart and give you the entire meaning with it. You see, if you're not hearing from the Lord, there, it may be that you're not cultivating a conversation with him. So you may only say things like, thank you, Lord. But the thing is, you're constantly aware of his presence, even if you don't always feel his presence. See, God's presence isn't there only when you feel it. He's omnipresent. That means he's, pre he's here right this very moment, whether we feel his presence or not. And so therefore, true power, true powerful mountain moving prayer isn't scream and shout and jump high in the prayer meeting. True mountain moving prayer is having a connection with God that is so pure in quality and consistent that you can speak to the Lord anytime and not wonder if he hears you. And you don't need him to prove that he hears you. You don't need a feeling. You don't need any sensations. You don't need a sign. You're talking to him because you know he's right there all the time. And you treat him 
like the holy righteous person that he is. God is a person. So quality, the quality of meaningful sincerity and not just vain repetition of meaningless words. A sincere and heartfelt thank you, Lord, or Lord, I really need you in this situation, means more to God than an hour of repeating meaningless words from a prayer booklet or something that you just learned. Something you just learned to do. A meaningful and heartfelt thank you, Lord, means more to God than an hour of words. Remember, Jesus in the Gospels talks about those who think they shall be heard for their much speaking. God doesn't want to hear prayers from a prayer booklet. Because He doesn't want to hear you speaking someone else's prayers. He wants to hear you speaking your prayers. Your prayers. So how often, when should we pray? Always. All the time. Should we have dedicated times of prayer? Of course we should. But we should be a walking, a person who walks about their lives with a conversation to God. So let's talk now about the power in your prayer. The power in your prayer will not be supplied by the things I mentioned earlier. Length of time, volume of voice, any other outward work. Now, these things will be a result of your developed prayer life. Amen. When your prayer life develops, you will find yourself dedicating longer lengths of time in your personal prayer. Does it have to be three hours? No. But there will be more dedicated time of prayer if your prayer life is developing. That doesn't mean you're more saved. It's just a fruit of growing closer to God. You will find yourself speaking your prayers verbally more often than maybe you used to. These are results of a developed prayer life. They are not the sign that someone is close to, quote unquote, closer to God than someone else. But over my life as a Christian, I've seen lots of people who can scream prayers really loud and do all kinds of stuff in a prayer meeting. And then all of a sudden, you don't see them anymore. The power in your prayer will be supplied by God Himself as you seek Him and not some outward show of your own. The power of God in your prayers is not something the Lord just gives away. Let's talk about that. God does not look down and say, now who's the loudest in the prayer meeting tonight? That's not who's going to give us power to. The Bible says God looks on the heart. The power of God is not something He just gives away. We're told in Hebrews 11 and 6 that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. In other words, God watches for and rewards those who are serious enough to diligently seek Him in prayer. What kind of prayer? Prayer that's diligent, prayer that's sincere, prayer that has developed into a consistent, quality conversation with Him. Not so much, thank you for this day, God, you know I need more money. Okay, not that kind of stuff, all right? That's the natural stuff, isn't it? Isn't that what the natural new Christian tends to pray? I would, I would say that if our prayers tend to consist only of what we need, we truly are in the elementary levels of prayer. But whenever we are, as the Bible says, circumspect, looking around, we will find ourselves, if our prayer life is developing, we will find ourselves praying diligently about things outside of ourselves. Don't we tend to pray more diligently for our own situations? Of course we do, and God doesn't really fault that. That's just how we naturally are. But when we find ourselves caring about others' situations, maybe not more than our situations, but maybe more than we used to care about other people's situations. You see, I have found in my own life that when I take someone else's situation before the Lord, 
And as a pastor, I'm called to do this, and I can either do this out of necessity and obligation to my calling, or I can do this as someone who has developed a care for that person and therefore for their situation. The first situation I gave, I had I got to pray for them because I'm a pastor and I just have to do this kind of stuff. And the Bible says that as pastors, we ought not take this role out of necessity. <laughs> He said, Paul said, but if I take it just because I have to, I'm still obligated in this time frame. This dispensation has been given to me. I have to serve God in it. But if I take it willingly and I really ask the Lord to develop in my heart a care for the person and their situation, and I pray diligently for their situation, even though there's that part of us that says, yeah, but you need to pray for your situation. Forget them. They're not even serving God like they should, and they may not be. But when we ask the Lord to give us a desire and a care for others and their situations, at least more than I used to care for other people, and then we push ourselves to diligently pray for them like we would pray for ourselves, now you're developing into a powerful prayer life. You're developing a powerful prayer life. And you may be surprised how many mountains God will remove from your life because you're praying earnestly for someone else's mountain to be removed. So the phrase diligently seek, Hebrews eleven six, he's a reward of them that diligently seek him. The phrase diligently seek, in the Greek there, it means to crave or to carefully search. And the Bible says there, he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. This phrase means to carefully search. It does not mean that you're really, really, really seeking God. I mean, look at the sweat pouring off my brow. I'm diligently seeking God. That's not what that means. It means that you are intentional about connecting with God in a meaningful way and an ongoing way. You're intentional about connecting with God in a meaningful way and an ongoing way. It isn't about sweat off the brow prayer. It isn't about that so much. It's about the diligent, heartfelt seeking of God in consist with consistent quality prayer. Now the closer you get to God, the more you and the more you learn to love him, the intensity of your prayers will increase because God becomes more and more real to you. Intensity of your prayer is not the diligently seeking Him Paul's talking about. Diligently seeking Him to intentionally seek God. But I will tell you this, the closer you get to God and the more you learn to love Him, the intensity of your prayer will increase. It's just going to happen. I believe that when people do not put heartfelt intensity into their prayer, they haven't really connected with God in a way that shows that God loves them on a deeper level. In the earlier Bible reading in Mark 4.31, Jesus mentions the mustard seed. He said it's like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown, into the, sown in the earth is less than all the seeds. And we talked about this earlier. There are other seeds that are actually smaller than the mustard seed. Orchid seeds are actually smaller, some orchid seeds. But it was, probably was the smallest seed that they knew of. But in the setting, Jesus is teaching about the kingdom of God. And here's what he's teaching. He's not teaching a biology class. Let me tell you what the smallest seed in the whole wide world is. That's not what he, hey, if somebody brings that out and they make a big deal out of it, they're probably not really seeking truth. Here's what Jesus was teaching. He was teaching his disciples that this thing that you're part of, though it looks small, is one day going to be so big that you're not even going to be able to believe it. 
You see, they were, they were a part of something that seemed very small and fragile. And I mean, Jesus was, go, he was going against the machine of the Pharisees and the entire Roman Empire. And so it looked like something dangerous to be part of, something fragile. It could be squashed at any moment. Maybe they'll kill us all. And yet Jesus was letting them know, hey, this thing, it may seem like a mustard seed right now, but this thing is going to grow so big, bigger than you'll ever expect it to be. And the kingdom of God on the earth through the ministry of Christ has gone to such a far scope, farther scope than any of these disciples could have ever believed. I and mean, if they could see how far the gospel has spread because of their ministry in Christ's ministry. Okay? So Jesus was letting them know this thing you're part of isn't just some overnight thing. It's not just some you know, weekend thing we're doing here. He was letting them know this thing is going to grow and others are going to be blessed by it. What did he say? The branches will shoot forth and fowls of the earth, speaking of people and others, are going to be blessed by it. Such as it is when you commit to cultivating a constant relationship with God through prayer. Quality, consistent prayer. Those are my two major points in this teaching tonight. Quality prayer. Consistent prayer. Go ahead and open your prayer with worship and thanksgiving to God. Go ahead and tell God all your woes and problems. And then start having a quality conversation with him. Amen. And I'm talking about things such as, Lord, we've got this problem happening in my work area or in my family or in my whatever, my community. We've got this real problem going on, Lord. And I'm asking you, God, to help me to know what it is you would have me to do in my role and in my realm to help dissolve this and bring a positive outcome from it. Lord, we got to do something about this. It's like you're sitting at a, as one of our pastors used to teach, it's like you're sitting at a conference table having a meeting with God. You may be driving down the street. It may be in your dedicated time of prayer, and it may be that you're driving down the road. You may be out on a run somewhere, whoever does that stuff. And, uh, <laughs> I'm usually the one talking to God as I drive down the street, not run down the street. But it's like you're sitting at a conference table having a meeting with God. So we have these meetings, especially in upper levels of leadership. They have these meetings, these weekly meetings, these monthly meetings where they sit and they talk and they discuss things. But what about having your meeting with God? What about having that constant conversation that has a quality element to it? Lord, we really need an answer to this. And I'll wait for you to give us that answer and to show us, but Lord, I really bring this before you. You've got this situation. It really needs to be dealt with. That's more than just, no, I'm da 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 give me a million dollars, Lord. That's more than all that. Leave that, to the, leave that to the underdeveloped Christians, right? Leave that to them. When you commit to cultivating a constant quality relationship with God, it may start off small as a mustard seed. It may start off a little awkward. <coughs> I would say most people, when they start going into this realm of quality, powerful prayer, it feels awkward because you're just not used to talking to God on such a level. So it may start off small as a grain of mustard seed, it may start off a little awkward, and maybe even, it'll even seem insignificant. But when you keep watering that seed with more prayer and consistency, it has the potential not only to bless you, but to bless others as well. To bless others as well. Here's what Jesus said in Mark 4.32 about that seed. He said, but when it is sown, that speaks of you committing to developing a consistent quality prayer life, conversing with God. When you sow that seed, when you, when you put it out there, he said, it groweth up. It develops into something more substantive. And he said, what? 
and becometh greater. It groweth up and becometh greater. That means it develops into something bigger than what it was when it started. Your prayer life should and will develop into something deeper, broader, more substantive, bigger than when you started. And then he said, and shooteth out great branches. Matter of fact, I brought a picture of a mustard tree here. This is what they turn into right here. The smallest seed, or one of the smallest seeds, the smallest seed he was talking about here, turns into this kind of tree. He said, it groweth when it's sown. It means you gotta, you gotta, you gotta put it out there. You gotta start, just start consistently talking with God in a quality way. It'll grow up. It'll develop. It becomes greater. It shooteth out great branches. That means it starts producing qualities in your life, useful qualities. He goes on, so that the fowls of the air may lodge under the shadow of it. In other words, not only will you be blessed by your quality prayer life, others will be blessed as you learn to walk with God. Isn't that good tonight? Others will be blessed. Your children will be blessed. Your spouse will be blessed. People will start looking to you whenever they are looking to someone of substance and quality and wisdom and things of that nature because your walk with God has developed within you the qualities of God. Moving mountains. People will be saved and healed when you pray for them because they are being blessed by the tree of your prayer life. Doors of opportunity will open when you pray. God will bless other people's lives through you and because of your commitment to Him. You see, prayer is not just getting stuff from God. Let, the, let that be for the people who are not developing, okay? Let them keep complaining and belly aching. And you know what they get more of? People who only complain to God, they get more stuff to complain about. God delights in taking that which seems small and insignificant and blessing it and developing it and using it to bless others for His glory. Amen. That's what God delights in doing. The Bible says the way to heaven is narrow and few there be who find it. I'm here to tell you that a quality prayer connection to God that is consistent is a narrow way also and few there be who find it, because few there be who look for it. Constantly stay in contact with your Heavenly Father through prayer, and you will see His great power working in you and through you. Most people pray for God to work in them. Very few say, Lord, work in me and through me. Work in me and through me. Moving mountains through the power of prayer. Where is the power of prayer found? Is it in the verbal loudness of your prayers? No, though your prayers should be verbal at times. Is it in the length of time of your prayers? No, though you should put some time into your prayer, dedicated prayer. It is in the constant quality conversations that you have with God. That means more than just, I need money, I need to feel better, I, I, I. It's more than that. God knows all of that. You can bring it to Him, that's fine. But God says, let's have a, con let's have a quality conversation, amen. Let's have quality conversations. That's how you diligently seek God, and those are the people who get rewarded. That brings us to the end of our... Bible study for tonight. Moving mountains through the power of prayer. Let's close in prayer tonight. Our Heavenly Father, we don't often pray to you as we should or as often as we should. So we're asking you right now to develop in our hearts, first and foremost, the understanding of, it, of the consistent quality conversation of prayer. For you seek your children who will develop to that level 
and have that kind of connection with you, their father. You seek your children who will do this. Let us be among the few who will develop this type of prayer life. Not just so that we can see the power of God, though we know that will happen, but help us more than that. Help us to develop a love for you that wants to connect with you on this level. For when we develop to that level, we will see greater things than these. Few there be who find this type of life. But help us, Lord, to be among those who do. And we will not regret it in this life or the next. We give you glory. We give you praise and honor. For your glory will last forever. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. God bless you tonight. Oh, move mountains to the power of prayer. Amen. Sir, our next service, Thursday night at 730, ready to worship God and give him the glory. God bless you tonight.